All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we bring science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms all over the world. Um, during these challenging times, we've shifted to broadcasting live into the homes of uh, families, of parents, students, educators uh, from all over the place. So it's great to be able to continue this learning uh, with you live, but this time in everyone's homes. So we have had a great week going on so far. It's a crazy busy day at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We've got six live events today, but I'm really excited for today's event right now. We've got a great new partnership with Duke uh, Lemur Center in North Carolina. We've been having a lot of fun uh, moving around the center and meeting all kinds of the scientists uh, and paleontologists who work uh, at the center, conservationists as well. Today we are joined by Carrie Whitman. She is fossil uh, uh, preparator at the Duke Lemur Center's Division for Fossil Primates. So she carefully uncovers fossils from the rock they're encased in, makes them sturdier, even puts the pieces back together again. Now what's also kind of unique is she studied environmental science and conducted research in Madagascar, but not on lemurs like you'd expect, on the rice agriculture instead. And Carrie, I think you'd agree with me that rice is an incredibly important uh, part of Madagascar and their culture. Um, so that, that's pretty neat to, to start your time in Madagascar and then, then move to the lemurs. So it's great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to learn a little bit more about uh, your life behind the scenes at the lemur center. Okay, yes, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two things. So I'm gonna talk about how I'm a fossil preparator but I'm also gonna tell you a little bit about my research in Madagascar. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. And then we'll just look at a little bit of pictures and slides and things, and then we'll have questions. And then I'm gonna take you with me live into the fossil prep lab so I can show you what I do with fossils. Okay, so I'm going full screen. Okay, and it should be good. Everything good, Joe? Looks good. Okay, great. So here I am. I am the fossil preparator at the Duke Lemur Center. And that means that I have a fossil that's encased in the rock still where we found it. And I carefully remove the rock from outside the fossil so we can see it, but also so researchers can handle it. And sometimes that means that I have to put glue in there to make it sturdy and I have to glue pieces back together. Um, and I can also figure out how to make a realistic copy of the fossil if we wanna put that in a museum or send it to another researcher. And this is sort of what it looks like when I'm preparing my fossils. So this is a time-lapse video. I'm getting a skull out of the rock there. That's the skull of an early primate from Wyoming. And what I was trying to do is get a big chunk of this rock off so that it's easier for me to get around to the fossil. And, and I'm using what's known as an air scribe. It's like a tiny little jackhammer that blows away little pieces of rock. Um, and so that is what I'm gonna show you a little bit later live in my prep lab. But right now, first I'm gonna tell you how I became a fossil preparator because it's a very specific job and a lot of people don't know how you can become that. Um, so when I was in college after high school, I went to the University of Michigan and I wanted to study things like ecology, environment and evolution. Um, but while I was there, I got a job working in a paleontology lab. And there I was trained by another fossil preparator, Bill Sanders. Um, and I learned all the kinds of techniques that you need to use with fossils and with making copies of fossils for museums. Um, and I worked there all four years and I was good at it and I loved it. So I wanted to keep doing it. Um, so after college, when I graduated, I first did an AmeriCorps volunteer position in Northern Michigan, helping with the environment. But then I was hired as a fossil preparator in Ohio at a bit of a smaller scale lab, doing lots of work with tiny little fossils of mammals and frogs and all kinds of things. Um, and also helping organize all of the fossils and how we collect them. But while I was there in Ohio, I wanted to continue studying things like the environment. So I decided to get a master's in environmental studies and I studied some rice agriculture in Madagascar where my professor used to study. And Madagascar, of course, is where all of the lemurs live. Um, and so I got to go to Madagascar several times, maybe four or five times by now. And the longest I was there was nine months when I was there on a research grant. Um, talking to rice farmers and working with them 
uh, about some of their problems with farming. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And if you've been exploring by the seat with some of my colleagues here at the Lemur Center, like James, Matt, and Laura, you already know a little bit about the connections in Madagascar between humans and agriculture and lemurs and other animals and, of course, the forest and the environment. And my research is nestled in all of those as well. In Madagascar, there are a lot of protected areas. This means it's a part of a forest or an environment. Um, that we want to really save either because it has a special environmental quality or it's a good habitat for animals. Um, and there are so many protected areas in Madagascar because Madagascar has lots of different kinds of species of lemurs and chameleons and bugs and everything that you can imagine. So we want to try to preserve some of this. So it's good for the environment and for those animals, but sometimes the boundaries of those protected areas can be a little bit confusing for the people who have lived in Madagascar for a really long time um, because they traditionally have used a lot of the resources in the forest to live and for medicine and their ancestors have too. So that means that we all need to work together if there's going to be a protected area to make sure that the people around also have what they need. And here is the protected area where I work. It's called Maramiza. And I don't know if you can see my mouse when I move, I assume you can, um, but the DLC, the Duke Lemur Center Saba project is up here in the north and where I was working was a little bit further south, but we're still in the east of Madagascar where all of these forests and hills are. So there's a lot of rainforest type environments here. And a lot of protected areas in Madagascar are managed by organizations from Madagascar too. So in this case, we have GERP, and that is French for the Group of Study and Research of Primates. And that group helps manage the trails in the park and the researchers that come. Um, and they have a patrol that helps make sure that people aren't cutting into the forest. And they also help the people around the forest with um, things for their livelihoods, like if they need a fish pond or if they need help with farming or if they need um, to start beekeeping even to sell honey. So there are lots of projects around here. Um, and it's good that we can preserve some of the forest in this place because trees are really important for lots of things. Trees have lots of roots that help hold the soil down and trees are tall so they can break the wind if the wind is too hard. They also help regulate temperature and rainfall um, and they give plants and animals a, a good place to live in the forest there. They also provide shade and building materials for people. So it's really important to keep trees around. Um, but, ooh, yes, the trees. The trees help all of these cool Madagascar animals and plants live in the forest. So of course there are lemurs here. Um, the Indri, this black and white one here, is the largest lemur alive today in Madagascar. It cannot survive in captivity. So that means that it really needs the forest to keep living. Ooh, go back. Okay, and then we have the Diadem Shafaka. So cute. And then we have all these species of birds and little tenrex and frogs and bugs, all of these plants that live in Maramiza. But we also have lots of people that live nearby um, and they need resources too. So people and animals, they always need these four things to live. They need food to eat. They need shelter to live in. They need water to drink and they need space. So in this case, people that live around Maramaza, they need space to farm so they can eat food, which is rice a lot of the time. They need a lot of space to farm rice. And they need water too, because rice needs water and they need to have water in their fields. And then for shelter, they might use some wood from the forest or they might use some clay from the soil to build their houses. Um, so when we have a protected area here, we need to make sure that we're protecting the forest, but we also need to make sure that the people who live here have what they need to live. And part of that is the rice agriculture. So um, here in the west in Madagascar, Madagascar has lots of different types of environments. It's really big. And out here, it's pretty flat. So you can have a lot of rice fields going as far as you can see, as long as you have water and you can plant rice and you'll have lots to eat out there. And the same is true in the highlands here in the middle. It's a little bit higher elevation, but the people who live here have been farming on terraces, these rice steps for a really long time. Um, and so they can get a lot of rice that way as well. But here in the east, 
we have lots of forests and hilly mountains. And that is where the Saba project is as well. It's a little bit harder to farm rice out here. You can see this little rice field down here in the valley. Um, it's flat, but there's not a lot of flat land uh, in this part of Madagascar. So what a lot of people end up doing is trying to farm on the hillsides too. Um, and that is traditionally what their ancestors have done. It is called Tavi. So when you plant on the hillside like this, um, what you would do is go up there and cut the vegetation, the trees, plants that are there. You let them dry and then you'd burn them. And the ashes from those plants help fertilize the rice when you grow it. But it doesn't always last very long because the rain can help, can wash down a lot of those nutrients into the valley. Um, and then you can only grow rice for maybe one or two years before you have to move your plot. And traditionally, it was okay to keep doing this as long as you have eight to 15 years between and you let all the plants grow back to help the soil. So you would have a plot and then you would move and then you would not come back for a long time. Um, but over the years, things have happened like more people going to Madagascar and building roads and infrastructure and logging. Um, and then, of course, more people need more space. Um, and, and if they move closer to the road, then sometimes they can't get enough space or enough healthy soil to grow all of the rice they need. Um, and this can sort of cause a forest fragmentation. So you can look at this map and you can see the dark green is where there is a forest. There's some forest up here. There's some forest up here. Um, Maramiza is actually this little section right here. But you can see the lighter green is where there's not forest anymore. And there, there likely used to be forest parallel here, like up and down around these dark green patches. But over the years with all of those things that I mentioned, like the road and logging and people coming in, like there's a small city over here, um, some international mining operations come to Madagascar, there's a mine up here. So there's lots of things that happen, um, but we wanna try to make sure that the forest still exists enough that the lemurs are okay and that they can connect to other parts of the forest and that people can still benefit from all of the things that forests give us. Um, so we want to make sure that the rice agriculture is okay with this. We wanna balance rice agriculture with protecting the forest. So a lot of the organizations in Madagascar tried to teach a method that is a little bit more intense. So it helps you on the flatter rice fields. Um, there's a lot of steps that you would need to do. You need special rice seeds. You need to have the seedlings sprout carefully and then plant them 25 centimeters apart in a grid pattern. And you need to carefully manage your water and you need to till the soil. Um, there's lots of things that you would need to do. And their hope was that using this new method that was actually developed in Madagascar in the highlands where it's flat, that you would be able to get more rice and that would help you not need to cut into the forest as much. Um, but, okay, so that's me and that's my guide, Nina. I don't know, are these windows? Here, can you see Nina? <laughs> yep. There's Nina, okay. That was my guide, he's local. He's from the area where I was studying. Um, so he knows everybody there. And um, of course I learned Malagasy. I learned to speak the language that they speak there, but having a local guide is really important because he knows a lot more than I do about that place. Um, and he can help me get to know the people there. So Nina and I, um, we went to all the villages around Maramiza talking with rice farmers to ask them about their farming and if they know about the new method that some of the organizations were trying to teach. Um, so do they know about SRI, that's that method, and do they use it? Um, and what else, what else do they have problems with when they try to grow rice to feed their families? And how can we all work together on this um, so that people have enough rice but we also are not fragmenting the forest any further? And what we figured out was that a lot of these farmers can't do that new method because they don't have the right kind of land. They don't have enough flat space um, or they don't have enough people to help them farm or they don't have enough time. A lot of the people that live here are always looking for ways to have income like money um, and they're looking for food too. So it, especially if your field is really far away, you might not have time to go to it every day to do all of these things. 
Um, and farming is really difficult work. A lot of people forget this in the United States because we go to the grocery store and we buy things at the store. But in Madagascar and in lots of parts of the world, um, often people have to grow their own food. So it's, it, can be, it can be a little bit stressful. Um, but so this new method that, was, that they were trying to teach wasn't necessarily working out very well for the people in this part of Madagascar. And so we needed to try to think with them um, to support the farmers and try to do things that worked better with the landscape, um, which James Herrera from the Saba project mentioned um, earlier this month. And so you can see here, we've got a big hill. So maybe you can plant some, it's in French, so we can't read it very well, but you can see over here, we've got some eucalyptus trees. Those are good for building. Um, we've got some grass. That's good like nesting maybe for some birds or just to keep the land having plants on it. And then as you go down here, we can plant other things like fruit trees and crops like beans, and then we can plant rice. Um, so using the landscape and then also supporting the farmers. So that's me um, at a farmer meeting where we were helping the farmers try to keep track of um, what happens on their plots. Like was the soil good this year or was it not good? Um, what kind of rice did you plant and did it work? And um, what other problems did you have? Try to keep a farmer's notebook so that we can all be researchers together and figure out the problems. So more farmer support and having an organization where the farmers can help each other. And then of course, replanting some of the trees. Um, so there's little tree seedlings that they started sprouting and they're gonna replant and try to reforest some of that area. Um, Okay, and so that was a little bit about my Madagascar research with the rice agriculture. And we're probably wondering, how does that relate to fossil primates? How am I a fossil preparator and also a researcher of Madagascar rice agriculture? But they are related for multiple reasons. So there are lots of fossils in Madagascar. There are recently extinct fossils and fossils that are really old, like 60 million years old, like the dinosaur times. Um, but the recently extinct animals, uh, the, the reason that they went extinct may have been tied to um, early agriculture in Madagascar. We don't know for sure yet, but we want to answer those questions. And the fossils that I work on here are help with the story of how primates evolved. So early monkeys and lemur-like primates and then eventually humans. Um, and then also my experience living in Madagascar and speaking Malagasy helps with answering more research questions. So if we want to go look for um, more about the primate evolution story, I can be a part of the team and speak Malagasy and help out with that. And Malagasy, ooh, wait, that's next. First, here's the extinct megafauna. So we have Megalatopus. Megalatopus was a really big lemur. Um, Paleopropithecus was pretty big as well. We call it the sloth lemur. Um, and then we have these things like the elephant birds. They were huge, they were bigger than an ostrich. Um, and then we had a little hippo that did live in Madagascar. We have a fusa, that's that carnivore. And this one was bigger than the one that is alive today. And then we have a big eagle. There are lots of cool animals that lived in Madagascar that don't anymore. And we think that maybe when humans came really early on um, and they started doing agriculture and having things like cows and pigs, that this maybe caused um, a change in the environment that led to some of these extinctions. And that's a question that we still want to try to answer. Um, and I want to have you guys learn some Malagasy with me really quick. Malagasy is the native language in Madagascar. And so if you're out in the village and you wave to somebody across the street, you would say Manakure, and you can say it at home if you want. So ready, you would say Manakure, and then they would say, and then they would say, Inavovo. and so that's sort of like, I'm really good, what's new with you? And then you could say, Tsimisvovo, you say, there's nothing new with me. I'm just walking to the forest, Mandea Natiala, and then Ao is me, Mandea Natiala. And then, why? Famanin. And then, because I'm going to watch the Indri, Tachi, Ijeri Babakutuza. And then Sarabe, Sarabe. So Malagasy is really fun. Um, and on the wall behind me, I've got some Malagasy. Um, I really love learning it and speaking it with the people. And if you guys have questions about that, you can ask. So 
let's do questions about this part first and then I'll take you live to the prep lab. All right, very cool, Carrie. So we are gonna to head to the prep lab soon, which is gonna be really cool as well. But thanks for sharing a little bit of, um, you know, what brought you to Madagascar in the first place and then tying it to the fossils. It's such an amazing place, but uh, you're right. It's definitely under threat. Um, and it's not because, you know, people wanna hurt the environment, but people need to survive, right? So it's yeah. great that you're looking for good ways that the agriculture can happen as well as protect the environment too. So we've got a great group tuning in live via YouTube. So if you have any questions that you want to start with before we go to the fossil preparation, can you send some of those in via the live YouTube link? And then if any of our live camera groups have any questions, just give me a little wave at the camera and I'll know to come uh, visit your group and see if any questions have come in uh, yet so far before we go check out the fossils. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's start off here. Um, we've got a question about uh, the hillside. After those hillsides are cleared, um, is there an erosion problem? Yes. Um, if, if the plants don't regrow there, uh, you will have an erosion problem. And unfortunately, a lot of the soils in Madagascar are just a type of soil that erodes pretty easily. And so in the West, um, a lot of people say this about Madagascar that you can see from space some of the red sediment that is coming out from the rivers um, because there's a lot of red soil and when it falls it forms what they call lavka. It's like little, like you, if you can picture the Grand Canyon how, how the rock kind of whittles in this way where the water hits it. Um, so yes, erosion is a problem when the plants are not there anymore, especially during hurricane season get a lot of landslides during the hurricanes if there's not plants to hold the soil down. All right. So I've got a few fossil questions starting to sneak in via YouTube uh -huh. uh, as well. And so there, Susan is wondering um, if you get to go out in the field and uncover uh, any of the fossils and um, if there are some early primate fossils that can be found in uh, Madagascar. Okay, good question. So one, yes, I have been to look for fossils before. Um, it's really an interesting experience. Um, and you go, let me, I think I actually have, this are, these are my little doodles about how you find a fossil. So we have a little river here. Rivers help us find fossils because they cut down into the rock and we can see layers through time. Um, and so we'll go somewhere like this and look in these layers and say, oh, I think there's a fossil in there. And then you chip at it and then you can get it out. Um, and then we take it to the prep lab where I can work on it. So yes, I have been to look for fossils. I really enjoy it and I'm hoping to do it again. Um, and as far as primates in Madagascar, that is a mystery that we're still looking for. Um, we find a lot of recently extinct animals like in the past 10,000 years. Um, but when we're looking for the primates origins around 25 million years ago, we still haven't found a lot of evidence from Madagascar. Um, so that is, still a question that we're hoping to answer with me and with Matt at the Lemur Center too and with lots of other colleagues um, from both Madagascar and the United States. All right, so let's squeak in one more. Oh, never mind. I've got uh, Ms. Erickson waving. Let me turn that mic on. She's representing students uh, at Stafford Springs, Connecticut. Hey, Ms. Erickson. Good morning. I have a question from Luke. He wants to know, are there any dinosaur fossils in Madagascar? There sure are, Luke. Um, one of the professors that I used to know found a type of dinosaur called Majungasaurus. Majunga, here, let me go back to my map. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, Majunga is up here where my mouse is moving. So there's a lot of sandy places up there, a lot of good places to find fossils. And that's what I was talking about, the fossils that are 60 to 70 million years old, the dinosaurs. So there's a Majungasaurus out there and it has like a little unicorn bump on its head. It's really cool. Um, and there are lots of other dinosaurs out here too. So yes. All right, let's squeak in one more from YouTube before we go to the preparation action. And this is from Angela. And she first she says, thanks for sharing some of your research. And she'd like to know just a little bit more about how you work with the local communities. Are they you know, recept pretty receptive to these kind of new practices to try? That's a great question. So with the communities, the thing is that you really, to work with communities well, you need to 
be equal with them. Like it's, it's not a good thing ever to go into a place and be like, you need to start doing this. Um, so what we want to do is understand their problems and why maybe the technique that was trying to be promoted in the area, it wasn't going to work there very well. Um, and so, yeah, but when I talk to the farmers, I always make sure to tell them that I'm not on any one, like I'm not promoting SRI, I'm not promoting Tavi. I just really want to know, I want to answer some of these questions with you. Um, and I, I try to understand their problems as well knowing that farming is really difficult. Um, it also helps that I can speak Malagasy with them. Um, that shows a lot of effort on my part and bringing the meetings to their villages so they don't have to walk a really long distance to come. Um, and helping them with things like this in Malagasy about how we can keep track of the things on our farms um, to help us know a little bit more about what the soil needs from us. So in my case, yes, they're very receptive because I get to know them. I speak Malagasy, I bring my local guide with me um, and I'm not telling them what to do. I'm asking them about their life and about their problems with farming. So that's really important. All right, excellent. Well, if you're ready, Carrie, let's start transitioning. While you're making the transition, I'm gonna squeak in Mr. Uh, Kaczynski's class. They're in Canton, Michigan. There's a bunch of them saying hi on YouTube right now. And he's got a fossil question as you're making your way over. So okay, we'll make our way and we'll answer a question. Here we go. Pop your mic on. Go ahead. Excellent. Um, my students are incredibly excited about the fossil portion right now. And one of the questions from my students was: uh, Is there uh, a specific yes. fossil that got you excited about doing more research in this field, or what was the first one that you had a, a chance to work with? Oh yes. Okay. Wait. I'm going to stop before we get in the noisy prep lab and just share my screen one more time to show you the fossil that I worked on. The very first one, go down here. Okay, so this, if you can see it, oop, oop, oop. Basilosaurus was the first fossil that I ever worked on. It's maybe a 60 to 70 foot long whale ancestor. Um, and when I first started, I was working on each of these backbones. So we had to make molds here. Let me show you about molds and casts really quick. Come sit with me. So when we make a copy of a fossil, um, we have to surround it with clay first. This is just clay. And then we pour a type of silicone rubber on top of it. Carrie, we... can I get you to stop the screen share so we can see it a little bigger? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Stopping the share. There we go. Okay, here we go. That, you know, now you can see it better. So we have a fossil and we split it in half around the edges so we can have two pieces. We surround one side with clay. Then we'll fill in with silicone rubber so we can get a direct imprint of what the fossil looks like in there. And then we'll put some plastic resin inside and make a cast of what the silicone imprinted from the fossil. So when I first started and I was working with that giant whale, it was my job to make molds and casts of those huge backbones so we could hang it up in the museum. Um, and there's still a Basilosaurus at the museum at the University of Michigan. So yes, that was my first fossil. That's what got me really excited. Um, when I was in college trying to figure out what lab I wanted to be in, I thought this is a cool lab to be in if I can work with my hands all day with clay and fossils. Very <laughs> cool, Carrie. Very cool. So into the prep lab. It's a little bit louder in here. And I'll tell you why. It's because I have a tiny jackhammer. So let me set you over here so you're gonna prep with me and here we go so this is my microscope it's very important so i can see fossils up close Ooh. here i'm gonna turn that off <laughs> it's not it's not too loud carrie if it needs to be on we've got a lot of loud air compressor stuff happening in the prep lab because of this It vibrates and it blows air. So it helps me crack through a big rock like this one. And here, let me get a little bit closer. Here we go. And so if I turn this on, it'll be a little bit loud for a second, but that's the cool part, right? So. So you do that for a really long time. And all of these lines here on the rock are from me going through with that tiny jackhammer and blowing rock away little by little. 
so that we can get our skull out. And this was the one that I showed you earlier, um, but it's free now because I have freed it from its rock encasing. You can see its little teeth down there. So that's part of why I have a microscope because these teeth, they break into tiny little pieces. Um, let me show you how the fossil looks when we get it out of the ground. All right, so here we've got what looks like a chunk of dirt, right? Looks like a chunk of dirt. Um, and it's broken up here. It's all in pieces right here because when the rain falls, like we were talking about earlier, you get erosion that happens. And so this was in a place where it was raining and the water will drip down into the rock and break it up like this. And so this skull, when it was in the ground, it was sitting upside down this way. So the rain got to the teeth and started breaking up the rock there and it put it in a ton of tiny little pieces. Okay, can you see? Oop, I shook it. All these tiny little pieces. Believe it or not, those are pieces of teeth. And yes, I can put them back together and I have started doing so. So that's why we need a microscope. You look in here, you look at these tiny little pieces of teeth and then you can figure out like a puzzle. You can look at the shape of where the tooth broke and figure out if you have a shape that matches and then you put it in there. So I'm very good at puzzles. Okay, and I can show you Boom, bum, 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 bum. Okay, here I'm gonna lift up this little piece, little piece of dirt. Can you see this brown, this long brown thing right here? That's a fossil. And that's what they look like when you find them. So then you slowly uncover the rock right there and then we'll be able to see what it is. Um, what's another cool thing though, for this skull, when it was still in its rock little house, um, we put it in a CAT scan machine, like when you go in for surgery and they need to see inside. And we can print out pictures of what the fossil looks like inside the rock before we even get it out. So this is good for helping me decide where I need to move my little jackhammer to get the fossil out. Okay, do we have, do we have questions right now while I'm doing things? Let me take a quick look at YouTube and see if anything's come in so far. If anybody has a question uh, on camera, give me a little wave. I can turn your microphone on and we can steal one of your, oh, we got a couple. So why don't we pause for maybe a question or two, Carrie, and then we'll let you continue. Yeah. All right, excellent. So I wanna bring another group into the discussion now. We've got uh, Cole who's hanging out with his dad. They're in London, Ontario. Let me turn on Cole's microphone. Hey, Cole. Hi. Hi, Cole. Mm -hmm. Hi. What's your question, bud? Do you ever have to make your own tools? Ooh, that's a great question. Yes. Um, so because fossil preparation is sort of a really specific thing that not a lot of people do, we have tools from all over the place. Like, for example, the technology that allows us to see inside was developed by engineers using this for things that they built. And we've got a lot of, mm, where'd my tools go? They're under my fossil. So this is a little pin vise. And we put this little pin inside. Sometimes we use needles for sewing. And then you can scratch really lightly. Like if I go, sorry, this is his eye, but that's the only place with rock left. So we would go in there and scratch, 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 like you're at the dentist. So we slowly scratch it off like that with our little pin. Um, we've got lots of tools from the dentist, actually. And here, hang out at my microscope for a second. I'll get some. In this drawer, look at all of these. Look at all of these dentist tools. So we can scratch in every way possible to get the dirt off in the right way. Um, and I haven't showed you yet the glue that we use. So this is, I guess we could count it as a tool because it's very important for fossil preparation. These little plastic beads, we have little plastic beads and we'll put 
acetone on them. That is what is in nail polish remover when you take off your nail polish. So it melts the plastic. And when we have it melted in here, we can drop it on. Here, I'll drop some glue on. Boop, 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 doo, 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 doo. Whoop, squirted it on myself. Okay. So ready? Bum, 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 bum. So you can kind of see, I'll show you in a, after I'm done doing it. There you go. Get right in there. So that's the fossil and I've just dropped some glue on it and the glue will work its way down like the water into all of the little crevices in the rock. And then when it dries, it'll be hard like plastic. So that helps us handle the fossil. And tools, hmm. We make a lot of really interesting things for making copies of fossils too. Um, and for displaying them in the museum, I have to use a lot of saws um, to cut and sand so we can make a base that holds the fossil carefully. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to visit uh, Mr. Kaczynski shortly, but I want to grab a question from YouTube. So it's a two-parter here for you, uh, Carrie. Sophia, who's 10, wants to know, uh, on average, how long does it take you to remove a fossil from the rock? And then David's really curious about how many fossils you think you've uncovered or freed from the rock. Okay, great questions. Um, so how long it takes really depends on the size um, and the complexity. So this one is mostly done, but it's still gonna take a while for me to get all of these tiny, tiny pieces back on. So we've got the ones that are in the box, right? And then we also have little capsules filled with pieces. And not all of these will go back on. Um, sometimes it just broke in the rock enough in the environment and we can't tell where it goes and that's okay. We'll get it back as far as we can get it. So how long really depends on how big the fossil is and how complex the fossil is. So like this part was really easy, right? But this part was really hard because we have to be really careful when we go in there not to blow away parts of the teeth and not to scratch them. Um, so, hmm, this one probably took me a few weeks and if you're somebody that does fossil preparation with a really big thing like a dinosaur, I have my friend Eric at the Raleigh Museum. He preps dinosaurs and it takes him months, um, sometimes a year to finish a full dinosaur fossil. Um, but for me, my total fossils is probably in the thousands because when I was in Ohio, all of the fossils that I was working on were tiny. They were like this big. Sometimes they were this big, but I had tons of tiny little frog bones and teeth from fish and like parts of lizards and things that were all really, really small. Um, so I've probably handled thousands of fossils by now, I think. I've been a fossil preparator for about 10 years. Very cool. And I can see Cole liked when you talked about the dinosaurs. He was showing us his dinosaur shirt. Oh, pretty, yes. Pretty Great. cool shirt, Cole. Uh, Mr. Krasinski, let me get your microphone on and we'll grab one more question and then we'll let you explore a little more with us, Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, Braden and Michaela in my class have kind of questions kind of go together. It was the, do you typically find an entire skeleton? Uh, and the second part of that is the, how can you possibly tell the difference between rock and bone? They look so similar. Great, great, great questions. Okay, I love this. So one, um, it really depends on the environment. So the way fossils form is that an animal dies and its bones will usually get washed somewhere. So like the reason that we can find a lot of, a lot of fossils by rivers and old rivers is because the animal died and the river washed the bones in, in a certain way and then they get buried slowly by the sediment that the river is bringing. So in situations like that in a river, you are not likely to find a full skeleton because it really scrambles up all of the bones over there. So you might find like the ones that I was working on, like one fish tooth, um, like a little part of a crab claw, you know, tiny things that wash up in the river. Um, but in places that used to be oceans, like in, in America, we have some of these places like in Utah, um, out west where it's really dry now. It used to be an ocean a really long time ago. It's a lot easier to find a full skeleton in a place like that where an animal would drift down to the bottom of the ocean and slowly get covered in sediment over a long, long time. Um, so that is the skeleton thing. Some people do find skeletons, but it really depends on where you find the fossils. Um, and then how can you tell the difference? Um, 
So sometimes the colors are different. Like here, the fossil is really dark brown. The rock is like, like gray like this. But if you look in the microscope, you'll see little flecks of dark brown in the rock. And that is because fossils are bones that have been replaced by minerals over a really long time. So they're not bones anymore. They're actually rocks now, but they're in the shape of the bone because the chemistry that happens with between the bone and the minerals and the rocks, it replaces it slowly over time. So you can look in the rock to see what color, what types of minerals are in there and what's replacing. And you can tell by, so bone is a lot more porous and light compared to a tooth. And if you look real, real close, you can see that the tooth is a lot darker than the bone. This bone's sort of lighter reddish brown, the tooth's blackish brown. And that's because of the difference between bone and tooth of enamel, that's really hard. That's also a reason that we find tooth fossils a lot because teeth are so hard and they're hard to crumble up. Um, so teeth are a lot easier to find than the rest of the bones. And for animals like birds, birds have really light bones so they can fly. Um, but that makes them really hard to find as fossils because their bones crumble really easily. Um, yeah, so you can tell, uh, you have to train your eyes a lot to tell the difference between the color, but it's easier with a microscope. It's easier when you wet the fossil with glue or with water. Um, and the newer the fossil is, the easier it is to tell. I feel like some of the really, really old fossils, like from 60 million years ago, they look a lot like the rock that they're in just because they've been there for such a long time. Um, but you have to practice a lot. Um, and hold on, let me get this box for you guys. Do, 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 do. Okay, so here we have a box that looks like sand, but there were actually tiny little pieces of fossils in it. Here, let me try to tip. There you go tiny little pieces. So when we have volunteers in our lab, one of the first things that we want them to do is look through some sand like that to see what fossils they can find because that helps you practice looking for the difference between rocks and weird minerals and a fossil. The texture also will tell you a lot. If you scratch a fossil, it will chip off into organized pieces. If you scratch a mineral, it usually turns to dust. So that's how you can tell. All right. Well, Carrie, why don't you show us a couple more things? We can wrap up with a couple more questions. Okay, great. So, so here I've shown you a little bit about the steps already, but when we have, we have a rock, I'm going to try to get a better view here. So yeah, you can see all the rock and all of the little chips that are coming off. So my process with this would be that I would carefully remove all of the loose ones from the top and then try to brush off everything that's around it first. And then once I'm sure that the fossil is not going to blow away, so I'll come in with my glue, right, and glue all along in here, and I'll wait for the glue to soak in and set up so that it's hard. And then I'll come in with my tiny air scribe. I've got a really tiny one. And then I will slowly start to scratch the surface, but you never aim at the fossil directly. You always go to the side because you want to blow away from it. And you also want to catch any pieces. I have this little box here. I, yep, you can see the box, all of these little walls here. That's because when I use my ear scribe, um, my tiny little jackhammer, it blows chunks away and we want to catch them all. <laughs> we don't want them blowing all over the prep lab. So I have to go look for a tooth on the ground. Um, we want to keep all of it in a, in a neat little pile so I can put all the tiny pieces in a box and get them back together. Um, so that's what I would start doing. And then with like with this situation, this one is a little bit more fragile, this one that I just showed you, but for the one that had the skull in it, this was really hard. So that's why I wanted to carve out a lot of this rock first so it would be easier for me to get to the actual fossil. Um, and now that this is here, we might also soak this in water um, and then it'll turn to mud and then we can see if there's any other tiny little fossils in there. Sometimes there are. And sometimes we find other little things that live in the water like little tiny shells from ostracods or from mollusks. We can find little shells in there. And what else do I need to show you? We have glue. 
We also have lots of different kinds of tweezers, tweez, tweez, so I can pick up tiny little fossils. Um, like, oh, I got too many boxes now. Too many boxes. Okay, so ready? We'll show you a tiny piece and I will not drop it. Here's the tiny piece. Oh, so small. And then I'll use the tweezers to carefully set the tiny pieces back in place and glue them. Um, and a lot of people wonder about the puzzle part too, because there are lots of pieces with fossils and we, they wonder how do we ever get the piece back? Like, like, is it true that that's how it went? And the thing with fossil preparation is if it, if you're not sure that it goes there, you don't glue it back on. So we're only gluing the things that can clearly, we can clearly tell that that's where it came from. And so like with the teeth, for example, Ooh, oh, well, our other skull is gone, but with, so I have this jaw that is from this same animal right here. And if I don't know where the pieces go, we have another one from another animal, the same kind of animal, and I can look at it and compare. So I can say this tooth looks like this shape. And I think that that's the same shape. So I can try to look at other bones and other animals to tell where the fossils might go. I'm never making it up and I'm never gluing it in place if I'm not sure that that's where it goes. So that's important too. Right. Okay. Um, do you want, I can show you more about the making the copies too, if you'd like. Um, that's mostly it for my prep station. We've got the air scribes and we've got the tiny little pins that we use to scratch the glue and the tweezers and the microscope um yeah i think we should jump to some questions because we're yes. we're running out of time and i bet you right. there's some more questions coming up okay sound good all right uh let's check in uh with uh miss erickson miss erickson do you have any more questions that have come in from your group yes oops there we go Oh, do you want to try from you, Ms. Erickson? There, yeah, we, there go. we go. Uh, Leona would like to know um, how and where do you find fossils? Like, how do you know where to look? That's a great question. So a lot of times we call paleontologists are the people that study fossils and that look for fossils. But paleontologists will work closely with geologists, people that study what kinds of rock and how they form. So to find fossils, we need to know what kinds of rock is there. We're looking for rock that forms when water deposits sediment slowly, because that's where that's where we'll find fossils. Um, or in mud, if there's like a mud wash or like a place where a lot of animals got stuck, like in California, there's those tar pits and they were so sticky that a lot of animals walked in and sort of got stuck in there and became fossils. Um, but so we work with geologists to find specific types of rock that we think will have fossils in it. Um, and then once we think we know where the rocks are, we have to go out and look and see if we actually do find fossils in there. Um, but it only works if the rock layers have been exposed by nature. So by water or wind or the, the tectonic plates of the earth shifting apart. Like in, in Africa, there's a place where there's two tectonic plates slowly shifting apart and that causes a rift a really big rift um, that you can see from space and it, it shows us a lot of rock layers. Um, so we, that's an example of a place where you could find the layers exposed. Um, and in the Grand Canyon too, there are also fossils there, but it's just the Grand Canyon is so old that we're, we find a lot of um, invertebrate fossils like shells and trilobites and that kind of thing. So um, we work with the geologists to tell the age of the rock, the type of the rock, how old would the fossils be that we would find there? Um, and are there fossils and what kind? All right, so we have a question on YouTube from Tristan, Tristan's 10. Uh, and he's wondering about the other types of fossils that you might encounter uh, along with the, the lemur or the primate ones. And so I think he's maybe curious about what would you do with other ones? Is there a place you can, you can kind of send those fossils to? Oh, great point. Okay, so yes, we are called the Division of Fossil Primates, but we are called that because originally, um, a long time ago, the first researchers that worked here were primarily concerned with primates. 
Um, but over time, we've collected things that are not primates as well. So for example, in Egypt, um, we have some primates from there, but we also have other, like, like the whales. We have parts of old whales that are from Egypt. We have an animal that's called a hyrax. A hyrax, there's still a type of hyrax alive today. You can find it on Google, but they're like little furry creatures. Um, <laughs> They hop on rocks and they make a lot of noise. Um, so we have bones of those too. Um, we have lots of different kinds of, we have evidence of birds and bats, um, horses, like the, all different kinds of animals, not just primates. Um, but yes, researchers do send fossils to one another. That's my ear compressor. <laughs> um, researchers do send fossils to one another. If there's somebody that really studies a lot about frogs and another, person found fossils of frogs, they might send some to that person. Um, also, what's really important is, I'm going to share my screen one more time. So when I drew my doodle, bum, 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 my little doodle about what happens with fossils. So you find the rocks, then you find the fossils. We get the fossils out of the rock and we prepare them safely. Then we make molds and casts for the museum. And then usually when people are done making the copy of the fossil, it's all clean. Um, and people have done like taking the photos that they need and the measurements, we send the fossils back to where they came from so that they can go in a museum there. And then the people that actually live in that place can also study them. But um, usually too, when we look for fossils, there's always a team. So if, if people from the United States are looking for fossils in another country, there's always a team of people from that country too. And that's important um, because the scientists there want to study the same things that we do. All right. Cool. I thought I'd check with you one more time. Bud, do you have another question? What fossil took you the longest? Ooh. Hmm. What fossil took me the longest? Sometimes it's the one, I don't know if I can think of a specific fossil that took me the longest. Hmm, you know, uh, when I was in Ohio, we had a lot of other students that worked in the lab with us um, that learned fossil prep from me. And one of my students, Rosa, we were working together on a backbone, a vertebra from an animal that's called an anthracotheer. That's like just a big lumpy animal, sort of like a cow, but not a cow. Um, and it was cracked into so many pieces, so many pieces. Um, and we, we tried our best to keep the pieces in before they crumbled away. Um, but a lot of them did crumble away and we spent probably months trying to get as many pieces back on it as we could get. Um, still looks a little bit lumpy, but yes, the ones that break into a ton of pieces are the ones that take the longest. So that's why the glue is important because you don't want to lose any of those pieces. All right. Okay, well, Carrie, I think we're getting close to our end time, but I know we've got Miss Erickson's group tuning in, Mr. Kaczynski's group turn, tuning in. We've got Miss Ricardo's four fives tuning in as well. Would you be okay if maybe they emailed me some more questions if they had some more? Because I'm sure there's probably some more out there, and then we can get you to send some of those answers back. Yes, that's great. Um, I will definitely answer those questions. All right, I love it. Well, first of all, a huge thank you to all the, the YouTube group that tuned in. We had lots of students tuning in this morning. They were definitely curious about the fossils. So thank you for your great questions. Thank you to our live groups tuning in with us today. Uh, it was great to take some of your questions live. And then Carrie, a huge thank you to you. Thank you for sharing some of your, your past work and then bringing us up to date with the fossil. Uh, it looks like an incredible a job where you need an incredible amount of patience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, good time and being able to tell those things apart so uh amazing job and i would never compete in a puzzle contest with you because i think it was <laughs> that handily but thank you so much uh for joining us today we're loving the duke lemur center events and we can't wait for the next one okay thank you so much for having me um and i want to say in malagasy i'll say goodbye which is like veluma velum okay <laughs> thank right. you thank you everyone we're gonna sign off for today okay <laughs>